Hey everybody, welcome to Board Online, Board Offline. Today we have part two in our instructional series for The Great Wall. And this is gonna cover all the, all of the things you need to know for the gameplay. So we covered setup in the first video. This is gameplay for the normal conventional game, the competitive game. And then part three will cover two player games and solo games. So uh, we're gonna get right into this. Before we do, I wanna mention a giveaway we have going on. Click on the link in the top right corner of your screen right there. That'll get you over to the video where we have this giveaway going on. And you can, it'll tell you how to enter that giveaway and you can win four games from my collection. So go over to that video, it has all the information you need about what's going on there. All right, let's get down to the table. I'm gonna teach you how to play The Great Wall. The Great Wall is played over a series of years, each of which is divided into four seasons. During the first year of the game, spring and summer are skipped. However, in most rounds of the game, the rounds will occur in spring, summer, fall, and winter order. Let's cover these seasons briefly before we get into the details of everything that happens within them. Spring is when the barbarians initially invade the area outside the wall. It's resolved in three steps. First, advance the time track. Then, based off this number above the time track, place that number of horde cards in the fields outside the wall. And then finally, refresh the advisor track by discarding the two leftmost advisors, sliding everything down, and then drawing two new advisors. Summer is then resolved in four steps. All players gain income from any overseers they have, which is indicated by this icon above the overseer space. All players may now decide if they want to get rid of shame tokens by paying two chi per shame. They are allowed to discard as many as they can afford. All command cards on the command track are now discarded. And then in T-Track order, players may decide to either reclaim their command cards or gain two honor for each of the command cards currently in the discard pile. During the fall, all players will choose and resolve their command cards. First, all players choose one command card in their hands and place it face down in front of them. Once all players have chosen their command card and placed it face down, they are then simultaneously revealed. Whichever player is first in T order will choose where to place their card on the command track first. And players will continue in T order, choosing their spots on the command track. The command cards are then resolved in this command track order. Each active player's turn is resolved in four steps, starting with the command step, which is when the command card is resolved. Command cards are resolved from top to bottom. Most command cards have two types of effect. Most command cards have two types of effects. The top and bottom effect are resolved by the active player, and the second one in the middle is resolved by all of the other players. During the activation step, all regular locations that are fully occupied activate. Also, any special location that has at least one clerk on it activates. The active player will choose the order if multiple locations can activate. So in this case, this special location and this regular location would activate, whereas this regular location would not because it has two empty spaces still. If multiple players are on a single location, they activate in T order, regardless of what order their clerks are on the location. All clerks from the activated locations return to their players' pools. In the next step, players check to see if any horde cards are defeated. If a horde card has all of their vital spots fully covered, as you see here, they are defeated. At this point, the active player's turn is over, and the next player on the command track takes their turn. Once all players have completed their turns, fall ends. Winter is resolved in three phases, the firing phase, the assault phase, and the end game check. During the firing phase, starting with the leftmost wall section, all archers placed in firing spots attack the horde cards in their wall section in T order. It's important to remember that if any archers are in the rest area, as you see here, they do not fire. At this point, if any horde cards were defeated, that would be resolved. And then 
the players will move to the assault phase. When the assault phase begins, players calculate the value of the wall's defense, including any barricades and any special abilities from the horde. In this case, the wall's defense is 8 plus 2 for each barricade, so 12. But the leader actually halves the wall's defense. So the wall's base defense is 4 plus 2 for each barricade, so 8. Players then compare the defense value to that of the Horde's offensive power, which is found on the bottom left of the Horde cards. As you can see, the Horde has nine power currently, and since the wall only has eight power, the Horde is stronger. This means that the invaders have breached the wall, and we'll discuss that more shortly. However, with one additional barricade, the wall's defense would be at 10, and so the horde would now not be stronger, and nothing happens. Once all wall sections have been resolved, discard all barricades as they are destroyed during the attack. After resolving all the assaults during the assault phase and discarding the barricades, players check to see if any of the in-game conditions are met. The three different in-game conditions are if all three sections of wall have been fully built, if the marker is on the final space of the time track, or if the shame token pool is completely empty. Now let's discuss in a little bit more detail some of the components of the game. On the general card, we've already discussed the starting resources, the starting tactic cards, and the T value. Each general also has a special ability found here. The strength of this ability is determined by the number of supporting advisors placed face down under the general card. Throughout the game, the player may gain additional advisors. Each time they gain one, they must decide if it is an active advisor or supporting. It's important to realize this choice is permanent. Making an advisor active means placing it to the right of the general, and now the player may use the advisor's ability. To make it a supporting advisor, the player places it underneath the general like this. Command cards are used by players to give orders to their clerks and soldiers. They are played and resolved during the fall, as we've mentioned. Each command card has a set of effects which are resolved from top to bottom during the command step. Some effects are only resolved by the active player, which is usually going to be the top and bottom action, and then other actions are resolved by all the other players, which is usually the middle action. Move up to two clerks to any Two locations is the most common action found on the command cards. It allows the player to move up to two of their clerks to any two different locations. Keep in mind that while these two clerks must go to different locations, they can go to the same location as a previously placed clerk. Command cards are placed on the command track and then resolved from left to right. Tactic cards are played directly from the player's hand when eligible as stated on the card. For instance, this one may be played when the player deals the last wound to a horde card. They would then get four honor. When playing a tactic card, the player may boost it for the cost shown at the bottom to gain the additional effect. A player may never have more than five tactic cards in their hand. At any time that the player exceeds that amount, they must immediately discard the excess cards. On a Horde card, players will find the offensive power here, which is the number that determines the strength of the Horde card when determining a possible breach of the wall. On this corner, players will find the reward. At the end of the game, the general who claimed this card gains the indicated amount of honor as long as no shame tokens are on the back of the card. If the card has a special ability, it'll be found here. These are called vital spots. And in order to defeat the Horde card, each spot must be covered by either a Soldier or a Wound Marker. As I mentioned, these are Shame Token slots. It only takes one Shame Token for the Horde card to no longer provide victory points, but each Horde card may hold two Shame Tokens. And this is the Invasion Indicator. It tells the player which wall section the most recently drawn Horde card will be placed in. These are artifact cards. Artifacts do not have any effects during the game, and instead they provide the players with additional honor during end game scoring. Shame tokens represent the player's disgraceful behavior in the eyes of the Emperor. There are two ways the player can get a shame token. 
If a horde card breaches a wall section and the player has no soldiers placed on that horde card, they get a shame token. So in this case, the green player would get a shame token. When a location with the shame token icon activates, if the player is the only player that has any clerks placed there, in this case, only the red player has clerks placed on the temple, they get one shame token. If clerks from two or more players are present, then no one gets a shame token. When the player gains a shame token, they must immediately place it in one of the following spots, either under any soldier in their available pool that doesn't already have one, or in any unoccupied horde card shame slot. When the shame token is under a soldier, that soldier cannot be used in any way. At the end of the game, the player will take a five honor loss for every shame token underneath a soldier. When the shame token is in a horde card shame token slot, there is no immediate effect, but players will not gain honor for that horde card at the end of the game. No additional honor is lost though for having the shame token. If players manage to remove the shame tokens from the horde card, then they will again be gaining the honor that that horde card provides. During the summer, after the overseer income, the player may discard one shame token for every two chi they pay. If the shame token pool ever empties and a player needs to gain a shame token, they instead immediately lose five honor. Also, if the player gains a shame token but is unable to play it because they have no legitimate spots either under soldiers in their pool or on horde cards because they just have a bunch of shame tokens right now, then they lose five honor. Then they lose five honor and additionally, the token is removed from the game. The time track displays three pieces of information, the current year, the lethality, and the number of horde cards that will arrive during the invasion step of spring. Lethality indicates the number of soldiers killed when fighting a horde card and is used in two situations, when a horde card is defeated or when a wall section is breached. In both cases, the lethality value of the corresponding horde card indicates the number of soldiers of each player currently placed on that card who are killed. In this case, with a lethality of one, one red soldier and one blue soldier must be killed. Killed soldiers return to their respective players' pools. As usual though, soldiers who are saved are moved to their respective rest zone. In the case of a breach, any soldier not killed will remain on the horde card. So we just mentioned saving soldiers. How does that work? Let's say that in this case, the blue and red soldiers are killed, but the blue soldier wants to keep theirs alive, and so they save them by paying two chi. Anytime a soldier is saved, they go to the rest zone of that wall section. For timing purposes, it's important to keep in mind that whenever soldiers are killed as a result of defeating a horde card or during a breach, they all die simultaneously. This means all soldiers who die at the same time could be saved by a single boosted withdrawal tactic card. The T-Track represents the status of the player's clan and acts as an initiative indicator. As we mentioned at the start of the game, players stack their T-Track markers in descending order according to their starting T-value with the highest value at the top of the stack. This is called T-Order. During play, this can be altered by sending clerks to the T-House location found here. Many actions are resolved in T-Order starting at the top and moving down. And when resolving game effects involving more than one player, always check the T-Track to determine which player is going to be taking their action first, especially for effects that specifically mention T-Order. Also, if there is ever a draw between players, the T-Track is used to resolve that draw. The advantage always goes to the player who is higher on the T-Track. Clerks are the general's executives. They deliver and execute orders in various locations. Each general starts the game with five clerks in their player pool. And new clerks may be hired by activating the emperor's embassy, bringing their total up to as much as eight. Generally, clerks are moved with the effects of command cards. A clerk may be moved to a regular location with an open slot or to any special location. Generally, when instructed to move a clerk, the player will take it from their pool and place it in any available location on the board. The player may choose to move a clerk that is already on the board, such as from there to there, 
but they are not allowed to move a clerk from a regular location that is already filled, as you see here. So we've been talking about locations quite a bit up to this point. And just to be clear, there are two types of locations, regular with these red dots and special with one giant green spot. Regular locations may only hold as many clerks as there are spots, while special locations can hold as many clerks as you want. A regular location must be full in order for it to activate, while a special location will activate as long as there is at least one clerk on that location. Locations will be activated during the activation step, and the order they are activated is chosen by the active player. When a location is activated, each player with clerks there resolve their clerks in T order. A player will always resolve all of their clerks at the same time before moving on to the next player. So in this case, it's important to realize if you are at the top of the T order, then you are wasting your clerk by placing it here, even though it was placed here second, because the red player will go first, moving their T marker to the top of the stack where it already is and then the green player will go. Once a clerk is resolved, it is removed from the board and returned to its player's pool. It's also important to realize that when resolving their clerks, players may choose not to receive a location's effect if they wish. Also, as a reminder, remember that if a location has the shame token symbol, then if a player activates that location by themselves by filling it up with only their clerks, then they gain a shame token. Advanced activation is an effect which may be triggered by certain command cards, advisors, or other game effects. For instance, in this case, Work Harder has an ability at the bottom that triggers advanced activation. And advanced activation follows most of the rules of a standard one, but it differs in two ways. If the location that is chosen for the advanced activation is a regular location, it does not need to be completely full, as you see here. Also, performing an advanced activation in a location with a shame token icon does not cause the player to gain a shame token if they have the only clerks on the space. And performing an advanced activation at a location with the shame token icon does not grant a shame token if only one player has clerks there. There are four different production locations, each providing a resource type. The lumber mill provides wood, the quarry stone, the gold mine gold, and the temple chi. When a production location is activated, each of the following four steps are resolved one by one in T order. The first and fourth step are mandatory, while the second and third step are optional. In the first step, players gather resources. The player takes one resource from the supply for each of their clerks placed in the activated production location. So the red player has two clerks here, and so they would take two chi into their player area. This income is increased by the presence of an overseer. As long as a player has at least one clerk at the location, they will gain an amount of the resource indicated above their overseer, in this case, two additional chi. This means that when the blue player resolves this location, they will get three chi, one for this clerk and two for this overseer, and the green will get no chi, because while they have an overseer here, they do not have any clerks on the location up here. After all players have gathered their resources, they may each optionally upgrade their overseer again in T order. To do this, they pay the cost indicated between their current space and the next space. So for the red player, they would need to pay four gold. If they did, their overseer would move up to here. Let's say the blue player didn't have an overseer yet. If they wanted to gain an overseer, they would do it at this time during the upgrade overseer step by paying two gold and then placing an overseer here. It's important to note that an overseer does not have to be a spearman. They can be any soldier, including horsemen and archers. Once an overseer is placed, they cannot be removed for any reason. It's also important to note that no player may put more than a single overseer in each production location. After the upgrade overseer step, each player who gathered at least one resource during the activation of that production location may choose to donate exactly one unit of that resource to the warehouse. However, it's important to remember that chi may not be donated to the warehouse. 
Each player who does donate either gold, stone, or wood to the warehouse gains two honor. Once the donate step is fully resolved, including if no one donated anything, the clerks are returned to their pools. The tea house represents the relationship between the generals and the emperor. It is used to alter play order. When activated, all players with clerks placed in that location move their tea track marker one step up the stack following initial tea order. This means that the player on top of the stack will have no reason to ever put a clerk here because since they would activate first, their token would go nowhere and then the tokens below them would begin to move. It's important to also note that each marker may only move once. The way this one would resolve is first the green token would move up one space and then the blue token. So the final result would be green, blue, red. If a single player manages to activate this location by filling all the clerk slots, their T-Track marker goes straight to the top of the stack. This is true no matter how many players are playing and no matter where in the stack the player's token currently is. The barracks is the place for fielding the player's troops on the wall sections. Each clerk present here when the location activates allows the owner to recruit one soldier of any type, as you can see here, as long as they pay the associated cost. Also, the player must have that soldier type currently available in their pool. Freshly recruited soldier may be immediately sent to attack on one of the wall sections, or alternatively, they may be sent directly to a rest zone. If a player has more than one clerk in the barracks and recruits more than one soldier, this is simultaneous. The player must pay all the resources all at once and attack with all the soldiers all at once. So if the red player was going to recruit one spearman and one archer, they'd have to pay two stone, two chi, and two wood to do so all at the same time. This is the builder's encampment. This is where the player can build walls and barricades. For each clerk a player has here when it activates, they may perform one of the following options. They may build a barricade in any wall section that currently has less than three barricades. To do this, the player pays two wood, stone, or gold in any combination. They also gain two honor. Alternatively, they may build a part of the wall by paying the cost of the next wall level as printed on the existing wall level. As you see here, it's five wood, stone, or gold in any combination. Each time a player builds a new part of the wall, they get honor depending on the wall level. Five honor for the first part, 10 honor for the second part, and 15 for the third part. If the player builds the wall in an area that already has archers, those archers move to the new section of wall that has just been built. Anytime the player pays for a wall or barricade, available resources in the warehouse must be used first. So if the player was building a wall for this section, they would have to use these three resources first, and then they could use two more resources from their player area to finish paying for it. At the Emperor's Embassy, seen here, the player can hire new members for their workforce. When this location activates, for each clerk a player has there, they may perform one of the following actions. They can hire a new clerk by paying two gold. When doing so, they take the clerk from this supply and add it to their pool. Alternatively, they may hire an advisor by paying a number of gold equal to the total number of advisors that player will have after hiring this one. So, if the player currently had two supporting advisors and one active advisor, they would have to pay four gold to hire a new one. They then must decide immediately if this will be an active advisor or a supporting advisor. It's important to realize that there is no limit to the number of advisors a player may possess as long as they can pay for them. It's also important to realize that unlike other locations, if a player has multiple clerks at the embassy, they will resolve them one at a time. Also, it's important to realize that, that means that when a player hires an advisor, all other advisors will shift left. In this case, there's nowhere to shift. And then it is refreshed prior to resolving the next clerk. This is the logistics center. 
Each clerk sent here may move any number of soldiers from one chosen wall section to another. Soldiers may be moved from one rest zone to another. Soldiers may be moved from one firing spot to another. It may be used to move an archer from a firing spot to a rest zone, though it cannot be used to do the opposite. And the logistics center may never be used to attack with soldiers. This is the War Academy. Clerks entering the War Academy gain access to advanced tactical maneuvers. Each clerk allows the player to draw one tactic card. If the tactic card deck ever runs out, shuffle the discard to create a new deck. At no time may clerks be placed in the warehouse. At no time may clerks be placed in the warehouse. Each tactic card states when a player can play it and activate its effect. The player can never play more than one tactic card at a time, though once one is resolved, if they have another one that is eligible to be played, they may do so at that point. Tactic cards have two sections, this upper effect and this boosted effect. The boosted effect will always have a cost indicated here. When the player plays a tactic card, they always use its basic effect unless they pay the chi cost. If they pay that cost, then they use the boosted effect instead. As a general rule with card effects, whenever an effect mentions a component such as a soldier or an overseer, that effect only applies to the current player's components unless specifically stated otherwise. Also, anytime two or more effects should be resolved at the same time, they are in fact resolved simultaneously. For instance, this general provides the player with chi anytime they play a tactic card. The player cannot use that gained chi to boost the tactic card because the tactic card and the general are actually resolved simultaneously. The rest zone is where soldiers are ready and waiting on attack orders. They are safe from breaches here. The horde card slots are where barbaric hordes gather up and prepare for the assault. The defense value found here is compared to the offensive power of attacking hordes. The build cost shows how much it'll take to build the next level of this wall section. Each firing spot may hold a single archer. Each of these slots may hold a single barricade. Each barricade will add two defense to the wall, and each wall section may have up to three barricades. Now let's discuss the invasion and potential raid that occurs during the spring. During the spring, the player will draw a number of horde cards equal to this top number on the time track, in this case, two. First, the player will look to see if there are any empty wall sections. In this case, the right wall section is empty. So the first card will go here. If there were multiple sections empty, they would fill them from left to right. When there is at least one horde card in the first row of each wall section, the next horde card is placed according to the invasion indicator printed on the back of the topmost card of the horde deck. So the leader will go in the middle section as shown here. Horde cards always go as close to the front in their assigned section as they possibly can. If a player attempts to place a horde card and it may not be placed, as you can see, the arsonists want to go in the middle, and they can't. A raid immediately is resolved. The drawn horde card is discarded, and then a number of shame tokens equal to the number of players is immediately removed from the game. There are two main ways to attack with soldiers, either by recruiting new ones or by attacking with already recruited troops using the attack order command card. Soldiers are considered to be attacking in three different cases. When they are recruited from the barracks and sent directly to a horde card. When they are placed on a horde card from the rest zone, generally this will occur from some sort of effect, again, such as attack order, or when archers are firing from their firing spot. It's important to keep in mind that when a player attacks with a new soldier recruited from their pool, they may attack a horde card in any wall section. Once a soldier is placed on a horde card, they cannot attack or be moved. And any vital spot of a horde card covered by a soldier counts as a wound. Now let's discuss the rules for the three different types of soldiers. Spearmen can only be placed on horde cards in the first row. So the pikemen are currently out of reach. 
When placing a spearman, the player immediately gains the reward shown, in this case, chi. If all of the vital spots are filled, an additional spearman may not be placed on the card. Horsemen work just like spearmen, except they may be placed on any horde card in that wall section. A horseman must always be placed on two empty and adjacent vital wounds. The player gains the benefit for both spots. The horseman may not be placed diagonally like this or this. The spots must be orthogonally adjacent. This means it's impossible for the horseman to attack certain types of horde cards. Archers are not placed on horde cards and are instead placed in firing spots. When the player attacks with an archer, they place it in an unoccupied firing spot anywhere on the wall and then wound one vital spot of any horde card in that section. If there are no open firing spots, an additional archer may not be placed, so this archer could not be placed in this wall section. If an attacking archer is already occupying a firing spot, it just adds a wound. Wound markers dealt by archers do not grant the player any reward. In each horde defeat check step, the player determines which hordes are defeated. A horde is considered defeated when all of its vitals are covered by either soldiers or wound markers, as you see the assassin is here. When this occurs, resolve these five steps. First, check which player defeated the horde. That's the player who has covered the most vital spots with soldiers. Wound markers don't count. So in this case, red defeated the assassin. Each player who has at least one soldier on the horde card gains two honor. Each player also gets two honor for each of their archers in firing spots. So in this case, red would get two honor, blue would get two honor, and green would get two honor because each of them has at least one soldier on the horde card. And then for archers, blue would get four honor, two for each of their archers, and green would get two honor. Then, since red had the most soldiers on the horde card, they will claim the horde card for themselves. It's placed face down in front of their player screen. If there is a tie, as usual, T order decides the winner. If no player has any soldiers on the defeated horde card, it is discarded with no player claiming it. Finally, after the horde card is either claimed or discarded, any further horde cards in the wall section are moved down towards the wall. When a horde card is defeated, some of the soldiers placed on that card will be killed based on the current lethality value, which is found at the bottom of the time track. So, with a lethality value of 2, that would mean that all the soldiers used to kill the assassins would in fact be killed. However, a player can save their soldiers from death by paying 2 chi for each soldier they want to save. Now to be clear, the assassin does have an ability that prevents them from saving any of their soldiers killed by the assassins. However, let's say they had killed a different horde that did not have that ability. In that case, perhaps the red player wants to save both of their soldiers, and so they pay for chi. Those soldiers would then be placed in the same rest area as the wall section they were just fighting in. It's important to note that any soldiers saved this way are not considered killed for the purposes of any game abilities or mechanisms that might trigger off of soldiers being killed. Finally, before we get to in-game scoring, let's discuss what happens when the horde actually breaches the wall. As you can see, currently the barricades are the only thing providing defense, and so the players have four defense against the pikemen's six offense. And so the pikemen have breached the wall. For each horde card in the wall section that is breached, each player will get one shame token unless they have at least one soldier on that card. So in this case, the blue player would gain a shame token since they do not have any soldiers currently on the pikeman card. The second step of a breach is that some soldiers on the breaching horde cards will be killed. On each horde card, kill a number of soldiers equal to the current lethality value. Each player loses these soldiers. In this case, both soldiers would be killed. However, if there were any surviving soldiers, they would stay on the card. The killed soldiers are replaced by wound tokens. All archers in the breach section are also killed. Remember though, soldiers in the rest zone are safe. It should be noted, by the way, that throughout the game, anytime a soldier is removed from a horde card for any reason, 
a wound marker is put in its place. This does not only happen during breaches. At the end of winter, if any of the in-game conditions have been met, players immediately enter final honor scoring. To calculate their final honor, players resolve the following steps. For each shame token under a player's soldiers, they reduce their honor by five. So if the blue player had two shame tokens under two different soldiers, they would reduce their honor to 85. It's important to note that the player may never go below zero honor in this way. If they would, they simply leave their honor token on zero. Also remember that shame tokens on horde cards do not reduce honor. Next, players add the honor bonus of their claimed horde cards that have no shame tokens on them to their honor score. So if the player had only claimed the arsonist, they would gain six honor. And players calculate the honor they receive from the three artifacts that are out on the board. So if, for instance, this was one of them and the player had one archer on the highest built wall, they would gain six honor from it. The player would repeat this with whatever the other two artifacts are on the board. After all of that, the player with the highest score is deemed the greatest general that has ever lived. In case of a tie, as usual, T order determines the winner. So there you go, that covers everything you need to know to play the Great Wall, to play the competitive standard version of the Great Wall. Uh, be sure to come back for part three where we're gonna cover the two player and solo rules for this game. And uh, yeah, I, this is a game that I've really had a lot of fun learning and getting into. It's, it's got a lot of good stuff going on. So thanks for watching. Be sure to give this video a thumbs up. Be sure to subscribe to the channel. And until next time for Board Online, Board Offline.